My name is Martina Vijver. I'm a professor of ecotoxicology at Leiden University. And actually, ecotoxicology is a research field in where we uh, study the impact of chemicals and materials on biota, so on animals and plants. And by doing that, we try to find out if chemicals that we synthesize as human beings also have a negative side effect on organisms and what kind of a reaction they have in the body, as well as that we want to know if that has consequences for generations and populations that will grow out of that individual, and if those individuals will have a difference in the ecosystem. In that respect, the ecotoxicology is a quite uh, multidisciplinary field. So we need to have some ecological knowledge, we need to have physics and chemistry, in our knowledge, and we have to have some phys uh, physiology knowledge. The research field is quite new. It's born in the 1960s. That's quite young, because if you consider that biology is already there from the start that we could write, and physics also, the 1960s is not that, that long time ago. And it all came in act because of this book, it's Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring. Back in those days, we had the organic pesticides that were the chemicals that we could spray and then mosquitoes died. They paralyzed and they died. In that respect, we did not have diseases anymore, like malaria, like the pest, like typhus. So we could control ourselves with that. And human health was increasing. The same Pesticide could also be sp uh, sprayed on crops. And because we could spray the crops, we could have increased food, increased yields, uh, so more food. So it was the best products ever synthesized by human beings. And it even received a Nobel Prize. So Paul Muller, who invented it, received the Nobel Prize. But due to this book of Rachel Carson, we also experienced that our watersheds were polluted because of that organic pesticide and that it tended to be accumulated in the food chain. So from the water it was picked up in an organism and then the next one was eating that organism and had little more and so it was accumulating through the food chain. It was accumulating so much that it was coming into the birds of prey and birds of prey were those eagles and bigger uh, birds that were really something that America was loving and still has, obviously, because it's in the, in the flag. Rachel Carson wrote a book on that because he said, if this is continuating the way it is, then at a certain time there will be no singing birds anymore in the spring. And it turned out to be right because the pesticide was accumulating into the food chain Eggs were laid, but the, eggs, the, the, the shells of the eggs were thinnered. And because the birds were breeding on the eggs, the eggs cracked and no juvenile birds came. So that's clearly one of the examples that our research field is feeding into the societal debate. Because by studying systematically what happened and by tracking all the indirect effects of those uh, pesticides, we could help and say like, okay, this is maybe a pesticide which should not be that much spread in the environment anymore. So the other way around is also happening. We see things alarming in the environment and then we can have research questions back in our research field. So having said that, we want to go dig into nanomaterials and nanotechnology. So the lecture is called the added value and the added risk of nanomaterials, of size. What you can see over here is the salt rose window of Notre Dame Cathedral. And actually, when the sunlight light hits the glass, all different kinds of colors appear. And the gold is very bright and shiny then. And the reason for that is because 20 nanometer-sized gold particles are mixed into that gold paint. So they give these shiny colors. If you have a look on the red, which is even more brighter, in that pigment there is a, a 4 nanometer gold nanoparticle mix, 
particle mixed in. If you have different sizes of gold, they will have a different color range. Those spectrometer uh, sizes will change. So those beautiful colors are due to the fact that we could use nanomaterials already back in the early days. This cathedral is from 1250, but also before that already we were able to use those nanomaterials. It was around the 1959 uh, that we were trying to find a way to manipulate at that level. So we used it for a long time, but back in those days of 1959, we were starting to find out that we could manipulate it. And it was due to the visionary lecture of Richard Feynman. And Richard Feynman was a very important and influential uh, theoretical physicist. And he gave a lecture, there's plenty of room at the bottom. So he already saw and foreseen that there is the play to go and that we can create many other things that we are currently, in, back in those days, not experienced yet and that we could manufacture that. In that room, with that uh, lecture in Caltech uh, University, there was Eric Drexler. And Eric Drexler was a student and he was very much inspired by Richard Feynman. And in 1986, he wrote the book, The Creation of Engines, the new era of nanotechnology. And he took the Feynman concept and wrote about tiny self-copying machines. And actually what we now know is that in 2016, our colleague Ben Feringa obviously got the Nobel Prize for his creations of nanomachines, amongst others, because they got it with the three of them. And he was the first one actually having them really build up. So you can see that it's a very, very new field, that nanotechnology. And what's so special about the nanometer? And what's a nanometer? Well, it's something that you can't see. You saw it already in the introduction movie. You can't see it. But how big is that then? Or how small is it actually? Well, if you have a look on the Earth and you see the diameter, and you compare that with the diameter of an orange, that same ratio is between the orange and a nanometer. So it's a dwarf. In Greek, the word nano is the dwarf. And if we talk about ions, because you heard about maybe uh, if you have metals, that you have ions or atoms, they're even more tiny. So a factor 100 to 1,000 smaller even. So that's what you can see here. But so it's very, very, very tiny. And if something is very, very, very tiny, it has unique features. Because size does matter. If you have a cube, on the, on the left side for you, the cube, and it's one by one centimeter and one, then you can count the sides and obviously then the surface area will be six, six square centimeters. If you have that same volume and you take it into cubes of one millimeter, then it's one, 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 is 0.06 square centimeters and because there are thousands of it, it's 60 Cent square centimeter as a surface area. So the same volume, but has an incredibly larger uh, surface area. And if you then go to the same cube, but then within the nanometer range cubes, then your surface area expands already to 60 million square centimeter. And that means that there is more atoms at the surrounding, at the surface areas, so there is also a higher reactivity than possible, because more atoms can directly uh, respond and react. Nanomaterials can also come with different shapes. This again enlarges the surface area. And then again the reactivity is enhanced. And it has something to do with the key lock idea. So you can bring them in certain places and have then a certain process going on. So here you can see beautiful zinc oxide nanoparticles and on the other side you have tin sulfate nanoparticles that which we mix, for instance, in sunscreens. So beautiful places, faces to see. So in what type of a products are they coming? Whoa! They come in quite some different uh, products. So first of all, uh, what I said already, uh, in sunscreens, uh, we use titanium dioxide nanoparticles in sunscreens, we use uh, tin sulfate nanoparticles in sunscreens, and they efficiently block 
the sun, so they perfect, prevent you from burning. Metal nanoparticles are used as a coating on windows. It holds that there is a, a, a protection of energy because it, it keeps the warmth inside, but it also smoothens surfaces because if you have small nanomaterials, then you've smoothened the surface. And what happens then if there is rain or if there's dust, it easily rolls off the window. So you don't have to clean it that often anymore. It's kind of mimicked from nature that we have these uh, lotus flowers where also the water runs off because of the little tiny nano hairs. We use nanomaterials in socks, uh, sports socks preferably. Uh, as soon as you go sporting, you start to sweat. Uh, sweat is produced and, and, and smelly because of uh, the microbes. If you kill the microbes because of silver nanoparticles woven into the cotton, then there is no smelly feet anymore, and we seem to be happy with that. <laughs> Nanomaterials are in drugs, in, 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 well, in drugs, in medicines, but drug delivery. <laughs> also in drugs, maybe, I'm not sure. Uh, but drug delivery, it's, it's the real <laughs> official term of that. Um, so what we can, we can use lower amounts of medicines and bring it to the target. So that's, that is handy, and it is also giving lower side effects. Nanomaterials are used in uh, solar panels, efficiently capturing in the sunlight. And they're used, uh, for instance, in helmets, uh, where we have that it is uh, scratch-resistant, uh, it's stronger material, and there again, as soon as it's raining, you cannot swipe up with your, from your helmet, so it's easy if it's a smoother surface. So they're more or less everywhere. And in 2009, actually, uh, the Ich Nobel ceremony was around the nanotechnology. And the Ich Nobel is there just to make people love science, to make, uh, well, it's an honorable achievement to get it, obviously, and it is aimed to, to let people think and to start laughing about new adventure, adventures, and also to think critically, is this the right way to do it? So in 2009, uh, Wade Adams received that uh, prize. And Wade Adams is from the Smalley Institute, they're the godfathers of the buckyball, so the, so the carbon-like structure, uh, nanomaterials, which makes products stronger, uh, which is also in airbag, so, so it's not a chemical process anymore, but it's, it's a faster pro process with uh, uh, buckyballs that is fasting up that the airbag is exploding and then it's safer for a crack if you're in a crash. And the task of uh, Wade um, Adams was that he needed to give a presentation of 24 seconds on his technology, and 24 seconds was really the strict thing to do. So you see a referee clocking the 24 se seconds, and after that he should be shut up, and that was it. So he came up with a kind of nice description of nanotechnology, which was making small stuff do big things and then selling them. <laughs> and that and that selling them is crucial in this respect. Because we were already able to use nanomaterials. That's back in those ancient times. But and selling them means that you can synthesize them and manufacture and manipulate them the way you want and put them in products the way you want. And that's something different, I would say. So virtually everything can now be made in the nanoscale. And it's actually more or less a new renaissance. It's a new technology. Things open up. There are new possibilities and challenges. And those challenges are there as well. So there's a huge value, and there are also maybe some risks. So it is time to find out if there's really a paradigm shift, is there something really going on, and do our current guidelines, how we test things in safety, in sustainability issues, is that really fitting our new technology, which is so totally different from what we have seen before. So is it safe? Is it sustainable? What's the role of the government? What's the role of developers, industry? Those kind of a questions. And it's needed at the moment, because the thing is that from 2000 onwards, those nano-embedded products were there. And they 
come into all kinds of sectors. But from 2009 on, we see that the market is growing every year with 22%, which means that it's exponential, because it's obviously every year, so it's exponential. And then you should do something. And that's what we do with the research group. We are trying to figure out what is the proportionality of how much value or benefits compared to how much risks are there with this new technology. And we do that with two different frameworks. And the first framework is a life cycle analysis framework. And it's a quantitative tool in order to find out how a product is developed, how much resources are needed, so how much material, but also how much energy and how much water uh, needs to be there in order to make the product and to use it and through the, all the phases. So we start with the raw material in the top, uh, we have material processes, um, then we have uh, manufacturing, assemblage, uh, product use, and then the end of life. And in all those stages, materials come in, energy is used, water is used, and it has a certain impact on the uh, environment. And how that impacts our planet, that's quantitatively assessed. And then at the end of life stage, it's either recycled, so it flows into material processing again, or it's dumped on a wa waste belt. So if we consider two examples, and we start with the skyscraper with the windows, we coat them with nanoparticles, metallic-based, and what we then have to do is that we make an additional layer. So compared to normal windows, we have some more resources that we need. We have some energy more because you have to grow the nanomaterials and we say growing, but synthesizing the nanomaterials and you have to put them on the window. So it needs some more resources. Then as soon as it's in the use phase, it costs lower amount of resources because you don't have to clean it that much anymore. Less energy is involved, less water, and maybe also some safety for the guy that needs to clean the windows. But that's not considered. <laughs> In that part, products get the green and clean claim. So if you see on your product this is really green and clean or sustainable, it's the part of the user's face. It's often not considering the whole product. And then there is an end of life. Well, it's a new technology, so there is no end of life yet, because they're all still on the skyscrapers. But the thing is that we have to recycle them somewhere, somehow, or we have to dump them. And the key thing with nanos is that they're more reactive, so you need lower amounts of those materials in the panels or in the products. So the question is obviously, are we being able to recycle them? And there are certain criteria when you start to recycle something. It's either uh, being very easy to recycle uh, because uh, it's a very valuable uh, material and very expensive, or there is an enormously amount of awareness and people are asking for that. And otherwise, it's where does it end up and is there toxicity? Other example is the solar panels. In the manufacturing phase, we can have normal silicon-based uh, solar panels, or we can have those with nanomaterials embedded. And then gallium arsenic nanowires are grown under gold layers, or indium-based or lead-based materials are used. And it costs an enormous amount of uh, energy because it needs to be grown in a clean room, and so it has been fully been controlled and fully been lined up. But if you have them and you use them, they capture in sunlight compared to normal solar panels with 10 percent points more. So that means that silicon-based nano, uh, uh, nano panels, uh, uh, solar panels, sorry, have around 32 percent of sunlight efficiently captured in and then transformed into the energy net. And if you are talking about uh, nano-embedded solar panels, then you can go up to 43% even. So it's an enormous gain that you get. And there again, the green and clean claim is there. And then you can obviously quantitatively balance out if that's the same energy you used in the user's phase or not. And then at the end of life stage, recycling needs to be done. And we know at the moment that there's currently no recycling, 
But we also know that uh, uh, gallium, indium are valuable uh, resources. It's not an endless mine that you have. So maybe there is something that we could uh, uh, recycle over there. We also do know that gallium and arsenic are quite toxic, that's for sure. And also that nanowires, they look like asbestos, are also... Well, we know something about that, we, so we know that there is a high toxicity. So here again, we don't recycle those panels yet because they're still on the roof. They have a lifespan of 16 years, so they're still over there. But the thing is that as soon as we have to take them off because of the end of life states, are we going to recycle them? Yes or no? That's the question. What we do know from nanomaterials that are already a, s a little bit longer on the market, so they have already the end of life states, is that they end up sem somewhere. And here we see different flows. So you see all first generation nanomaterials, which are the metal based nanomaterials, which are the silicon and carbon based nanomaterials. And they end up in more or less every sector. So you see automobile catalysts, electronics, energy coatings, and so on. So they're everywhere, and you also see that most of them are ending up in the landfill, so the waste belt. And if not, then they follow the path through the wastewater treatment plant, and there you have, obviously, that the f water and the sediment is separated, and then it either ends up in the soil or the landfill, or in the water fraction. And some parts will go to a waste incinerator plant, so they're burned, let's go like that, and then you can have it uh, in the air and the other compartments again. And what happens exactly in those compartments, that's what we face with our risk assessment framework. So the second framework we're working in. And the risk assessment framework is that we know where is the exposure, so, so where does it go, as I showed you, and also how long is that? Is that a peak exposure or is that a long-term exposure and forever a kind of diffusive emission? And then we compare that values with what we find as effects in the lab studies. So what is the effect uh, of, of, of uh, this type of a material with such an exposure, and can we see what is a sensitive endpoint? And then we compare those data, and then you can calculate the ratio and make a risk characterization. So trying to find out if it's hazardous or not. And these are frameworks that are built on soluble uh, uh, molecules, so, so, so um, not for nanomaterials. And the question is obviously, do those frameworks work for nanomaterials? So let's dig into that. <coughs> if you have a molecule or a soluble chemical and you mix it into a watery solution, you get a transparent uh, uh, solution. And here and then everything is transparent. If you mix in particles, they will not dissolve fully, so they will form a suspension, so it will be cloudy and it will be heterogeneity in that glass. And bigger particles, which have a higher density, will tend, uh, 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 which will be heavier, they tend to settle down, obviously, and those that will be having a lower density, they start to float. So that's going on with the suspension. So it's different than from a molecule which is mixed in into solution and where our f frameworks are fit for. So that looks like this, and the sedimentation rate will be depending on the size. And if it's a metallic nanoparticle, it will dissolve because there will be ions at the surface, and the surface for, of a small particle is huge, so more ions will be released, and it will go faster than with bigger particles. So we have to consider all those dynamics. And if you do a test then, and you run it with certain species, then you need to be sure what is going on in your, in your environment or in your jar, because if it's something that is swimming, in the middle of that jar, then it has a certainly different exposure than if something is on the bottom of that jar, if it's a sediment dweller, for instance. Then the exposure over time will increase, and in the water column, it will decline over time. So we do have to think about that. 
So see, we have some key players in our lab, and these are our animals. So on the top, you can see uh, Daphnia magna, which is uh, my favorite pet, I would say. It's a water flea, uh, and she is swimming in the middle of the water column. And then you have the Volsomia candida, which is a springtail, and that's the creature that lives also in your plants. If you're having a plant at home, then you see sometimes white spots, two millimeter spots, jumping around. Well, that are wingless insects, and we use them as testing organisms in soils. And if something is going into the air, you obviously have to have an air, uh, uh, an organism that lives in the air, so then we go for the bumblebees. And then here we have zebra fish larvae, fruit flies, earthworms, Isenia andre, and chironomids, which are the ones that are on the sediment. So we need to understand what's going on in that jar with that certain nanomaterial, and then we can choose our test organisms and, and do the right test, I would say. And then we consider uptake routes. And the thing with molecules or ions is that they have to cross the membrane via a certain gate, the calcium channels, the sodium channels, and so on. But particles are different. Particles just penetrate. So if you're between 4 and 10 nanometers in size, you just simply penetrate the membrane. If the particles are bigger, uh, between 10 and, and, and one mon micron, then there is pinocytosis pathway, and if it's bigger, 500 nanometers, then it's, it's getting into a lump, I would say, and then it's phagocytosis, it brings it into the body. And it has different uptake routes than those molecules that are transformed over, transformed over the, the gates. And by doing another pathway and entering in a different way in the body, but there you will shed off your chemicals, will have a response that we did never experience before, because we simply didn't have that pathway before. So we have to consider in biology and how we think that responses are differently and consider, okay, what could be the pathway of entrance for this nanomaterial? And then we test algae. And algae are just uh, 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 primary producers. And on the top, you see that there is a control situation. You see nice, round, oval uh, uh, cells. And you see everywhere the green, that's the chlorophyll. So it's nicely shaped, and everywhere it's the same chlorophyll. And the chlorophyll is making that we have that CO2 produced. Um, um, uh, taken up, and then oxygen is produced. And it helps to grow. So if you have the bee which is exposed with silver nitrate, which is just a silver salt, then you can see that it is experiencing something because the morphology is, is getting bigger, so he's getting swollen a bit, but everywhere is the chlorophyll still. So the cell is healthy, uh, but it's just a, a bit bigger. If we expose that to the same dosage of silver nanoparticles, then you can see that it is more or less a double in size, and everywhere are, are clumps of chlorophyll. That means that it's not a vital cell anymore, it's not how it should be anymore, so it's under stress, and actually, if you're the one that is needing to feed on that, your mouth has to be double the size if you want to eat it at once. And that's my species, because that's the thing that she is eating, my Daphnia magna. So they're all over, but what you can see is that you, that you have the two antenna like that, and she has, she has goggles like the minion, so she's not having eyes like this, but like they're both clumped together. And then some are not pregnant, and some you see in the middle, you see those three little eggs, so she is pregnant. And then you see over there on the, on the, on the left for you, you see already the shape of juveniles. So they're already full-grown water flea babies, they're neonates, we call them, and they are more or less soon to be released. And you see all those uh, uh, LC around it. And now I got a very nice movie of Wim van Egmond. He, he even won the Nikon uh, camera prize with this. Um, so I asked him kindly if I could use it, because here you see my creature, there's the eye, you see the heart, you see the gut system, and she's releasing now one juvenile. You see that? And there she's trying to push out that one. 
and you see that there is green dots, that's the LT again, thank you. And, uh, and the heartbeat, so you can see how beautiful she is, and now, she, now you know why I love her. <laughs> and, and those ladies, because they're all ladies, if they're stressed, they start to produce winter eggs, and then they will release one or two males, and then they cross and they try to cope with their gene codes again against all those stressors. But most of the time, they're ladies. And we expose them to polystyrene nanoparticles, 25 nanometer. And what you can see, you see all those yellow dots around the gut system that are the lipid droplets, so that's the energy bump she has, and then she can do her activities. And you can see with the confocal microscope, so the fluorescent dots, there we can see where the nanoplastic is accumulated. So they are in the nano, uh, the, the, the nanos are in the body and they're in the fat droplets. If we then have a one that is pregnant, and you can see that she's starting to release it more or less already. If we have then the confocal microscope and find out where those nanoparticles are, then you can see them all covered in the gut tract, so in the, in the gut system. You see them a little bit in the lipid droplets, but you see that all those juveniles, which are not yet born, are covered around with nanomaterials. So before they have ever been exposed themselves, they are already covered with those nanomaterials. And there are two ways. It could be maternal transfer via the lipid droplets. It could be because she needs to aerate sometimes those juveniles. And then she opens the brood pouch in order to have new water in. And obviously in that water, if she does that nearby the bottom, uh, the sedimentation, then all those particles come in. And they have a new absorption site. So they will stick to those juveniles. Well, they are born. Um, they're vital, but currently we're digging around if, if there are uh, long-term effects or not. So following multi-generations with them. So does it happen also with uh, uh, other organisms? Because this is my species, which I love, but all the other creatures in nature, is that also going on like that? Well, we use also zebrafish larvae, and I have a time lapse with that, so you can see how she is developing. Uh, a zebrafish lays eggs. And then because of that, we, we can have the developmental time followed outside the body and then see what happens. So it's a beautiful time lapse. And where you can see that cells are grown around the yolk, which is the energy source. And we use those zebrafish eggs because they, uh, zebrafish have 70 till 90% of the gene coding the same as mammals, as rats, as mouse. And these are obviously way easier to use, because you don't have to emit through the mother's body into how it develops. And if you follow an early state of development of species, that's the sensitive life state. So we can have early recognition of uh, if, if uh, materials or chemicals make malformations, and we absolutely know how they develop, so we can score that against, well, the blanks on how it, how it should develop. So it's a huge eye, as you can see, and in the middle, that bulb, that is the yolk, where they take the fat and the, and the energy to, uh, to grow. And at a certain point, the yolk is gone, then she needs to, o or she or he needs to open the mouth, and then they start to eat themselves. And after five days, we stop testing because then it starts to be an animal, and then we are not allowed to test anymore. So you can see now that she's trying, the heart is beating. You see one time, I guess, that the mouth is opening, and then she swims away. <laughs> but there it goes. So we exposed them also to polystyrene nanoparticles, and we did different sizes, so 25, 50, uh, 80, 100, 200, 250, these kind of uh, uh, sizes. And what we saw was that everything which was bigger than 50 nanometers in size was stuck into the gut system. So the whole gut system was stuffed full, 
but that was it. It was blocking, that's it. But everything that was smaller than 25 nanometer was penetrating through the membranes and moved around through the body, and even up to the, into the eye. So that's what you can see over here. Those red dots are cherries, gold, red gold colored uh, nanomaterials. And we verified that with different shapes of gold nanoparticles. And uh, you can see that here. And, and, and there is a red circle around it, so it's a clump of gold that is sticking together, and it moves across into the body. And as soon as a macrophage, which is the clearance kind of organ that captures things and that helps you to get rid of things which are not from your body, that is uh, captured around it, that's what you see after uh, 516 seconds, then it brings it across the membrane of the artery wall, and as soon as it's in the artery wall, uh, crossing the artery wall, it comes into the bloodstream and then it's gone and goes to the clearance organs. So then we get rid of it. But it moves along through the body quite a long time, and we can follow that. And that's what we also can see from humans. So then you can get this kind of uh, uh, newspaper articles, uh, microplastics can be found in uh, human feces. Luckily, maybe, because otherwise we were a walking waist belt. Yeah? <laughs> so it helps us to say, like, okay, so we have exposure, it turns to be in our gut system, it might penetrate our membranes, but we get rid of it as well. That's at least something. And that's what we all do in the lab situation. So we're all very well trying to figure out what are the pathways of those nanomaterials in our lab systems. But actually, that's not the thing that we want to protect. Because if you have it in your feces, it goes into the toilet, and then it comes into the wastewater treatment plant, where we have all our microbes that try to get and help us to clean our nutrients and our, our, all our stuff. And if we kill those, then we don't have those plants anymore working for us. And it's also released then in the environment. And that's what we want to protect, because that's something that we use. We value it because it has an intrinsic value. So we like the organisms that are living around there, and we even have stems made out of that, so it seems to be our national pride. Yes, it's still our national pride. Proud. But the thing is that we also use clean nature. And it has several functions. So it has supporting functions, it has regulatory and provision functions and cultural values. We want to have food. We want to have a normal climate. We want to have clean water. We want to have that there is pollination. We, want to, we use it in our daily life. We use it in an, our agriculture. We have two-thirds of the Netherlands is agriculture. So we seem to use it a lot. So we have to protect that. And that's difficult in the field, in the, in the lab. So we go into the field and try to do the same type of test and to find out if all those values and services that we want to use are still in place. So we created the living lab, the living lab in Leiden, um, which are 36 ditches, uh, well connected to uh, the watersheds around the, the river, uh, the Old River Rhine, actually. Um, it's it's it dicked one and a half meter below the normal uh, ground floor. And uh, the reason for that is because then you're at Roman times, so you, they did not have synth synthesized pesticides and they did not have strange things that we manufactured already. So we have a clean baseline in a way. And then we can use the, the advantages of the, of the lab, so do replications and do a full factorial design with different treatments. We can use that, but we do it with real organisms and with real environmental realism and with real environmental interactions because it's raining over there and it's cold sometimes. And there are 140 different species in the ditch, not only one single Daphnia in a jar. So we can have interactions and we can have indirect effects quantified. And that's what we do. And what you then see is that you have organic material. And on the, on the top of the organic material, which is now here baked as a cookie kind of thing, algae grow, uh, fungi grow, so a biofilm is growing. Ma bacteria are growing. And then we spike some with silver nanoparticles and some not. 
and then we have a look what's going on. And what we see is that then the microbial community that is growing on top of those organic material layers is different. It's just m altered because of that spike of silver nanoparticles. And then the acellus, the, the water isopod, is feeding on that. And it turned out that the growth of these creatures was declined because of that different bacterial uh, layer around the organic material. And that is directly influencing our detritus pathway. So uh, the way that, that, that leaves fall in or, or organic materials fall in the ditch and then we don't have to dig it around and, and dig it away every year because the nature is cleaning it up in a way and we don't walk through, through uh, one meter of, of, of leaves because it's autumn, that's the detritus pathway. And it has a consequence then, again, on how the ecosystem functions. So then you get typically different communities and typically different species because they have an interaction with each other. And that's the part that we are trying to understand and to quantify. And this takes a lot of time because there are indirect pathways. And you have to have a huge lab facility to do this. And you have to have long time of patience, I would say, and also manpower over there in order to have these things going on. But we need it because, as we also know, is that all, as humans, we only rarely can foresee our consequences. So we did also think that plastic was the rocket science. Yeah? It brought us very much benefits. But we also now see that we have to clean it up and that we only see the fraction of it because we only see the bigger fragments and we don't see the nanoplastics around. And it all has to do with the collagen dilemma. So in early phases of development, it's easy to change things. You have influence on what you manufacture. It has not that much of cost to correct it. But if as soon as it's in the market and it's a full sector that is driving that, then you don't have that influence anymore. And with the plastics, we're at the end stage. But with the nanos, we're in the beginning. So I love technology. Wait a sec. I really, really, really appreciate it. And I know that we're in the beginning from many of our products and we can do something now by spending 1% or 2% of our research and development but yet already in the pilot phase, in the lab phase on safety and on sustainability issues, then we can create something and we can make it safe by design. And we don't end up with something that which we don't want or that we didn't oversee fully. And I think, because I was thinking a long time of what can I say, because not everybody is working in, in industry and not everybody is synthesizing its own nanoparticles, I understand that, but there is something that you can do. So realize that nanos are everywhere. Not, not, not a single thing you have at the moment which is not containing a nano. So even your clothes, everything is containing nanos. The spray on your shoes, because you want to have a rain coating, whatever spray. That, that, there are all nanos involved in that. And realize that you don't even know that. And that's not labeled, and we don't need to have it labeled at the moment. That's something that is now debated in environmental issues and, and so on. Realize also that there is low emissions currently. So we don't see enormous disasters. That's because the nanotechnology is new. So most of the times we're getting stronger or having a longer lifespan, which means that they're still on the roof or they're still having, in, uh, the products are still in use. So they're not yet emissions yet that much. But it is nanomaterial specific. So we also know some examples that nanomaterials are released very fastly from the sunscreens. There are countries where they, at the moment, ban the sunscreens which have nanomaterials. And that's because they are thinking that the coral reefs are immediately uh, uh, attacked and bleached out because of those nanomaterials. We know that it is in toothpaste. It's maybe not needed in toothpaste. This kind of things you can... Make your assessments yourself. We also have parts that we do need nanomaterials. So if it's getting a longer duration in a product, if it's getting more sustainable that way. So 
getting to know that there is a proportionality between benefits and risks and that it is product depending and that you can do something about that. That's something that I would like to plea for. And that also means that you have to start the societal debate. Because as long as you're not well informed, you cannot have this debate, what is the benefits of it and what are the risks. And maybe sometimes, in some cases, the nanomaterials are the alternative. And in some cases, we just have simply to say, there are other alternatives. And that's what I would like to give to you and have it as a take-home message. Thank you. Oh, oh, I, I, I might have done a thing that wasn't right.